brought one plant with me. And it did not have a very good trip. It got really, really cold, and so I had to cut it way back. But I love this plant. When I left Connecticut for the last time, um, I took a cutting from my friend's night blooming Cyrus. So this is a plant, a cactus plant that grows huge and it only blooms once a year at night. And it's white and fragrant and beautiful. And so I took that cutting with me to Wyoming and I nurtured it, right? And it, it sort of grew a little bit. No flowers ever. So it moved with me to Pennsylvania. It got a little bit bigger, but no flowers. It moved with me to Wisconsin. Again, growing, but no flowers. It moved with me back to Illinois. Finally, finally, after 15 years, it got a bud. the butt. <laughs> and it bloomed. But apparently the cutting I took off the night blooming Cyrus that is supposed to be white isn't a night blooming Cyrus. <laughs> because mine bloomed during the day and was bright pink. So apparently there must have been two plants there or I don't know, sometimes when you cut a plant, it gives you a different color for the next person who propagates it. Um, and mine decided to bloom pink and during the day. And so the reason I was bringing it this year and not just bringing a cutting to start over again was because it took me 15 years to get a flower but it was gonna bloom again. So I was gonna have this plant actually blooming two times. And then it did not do well on the trip. It, there isn't a picture there. You can see it in its full glory, but right now it, I had to cut off all the dead parts. So it's looking a little peaked and I'm hoping that with the right conditions, it likes a good sunny spot. That's when it started flourishing, when it went in my southern window and was getting light all the time. It grew so big, I had to repot it in a giant pot. So I'm hoping that maybe in three years, <laughs> I will get a new flower on my Cyrus plant. In our scripture today, Jesus tells a parable about a fig tree. He says that at the edge of the field in the vineyards, there was a fig tree that was planted, but it didn't bloom. And the owner of the vineyard comes by and says, for three years I've been waiting for figs on this fig tree. And nothing. There have been no figs. I want you to cut it down. And so the gardener says to him, let me have one more year. One more year. I'll dig around it. I'll add manure. I'll tend it carefully. And if there are still no figs, if there are still no figs, then you can cut it down. As I've been sitting with this scripture all week, I started thinking about fallow places, about that 
times in our life where it is just really hard to bloom. You know, like my plant that took 15 years to figure out how to do it. I think churches right now are in that spot where we don't know what comes next. And we don't know what we completely have right now. And it feels a little scary and we're not sure if we're ever going to bloom again. And that's when this scripture sort of takes hold of you, right? Because what God says, what Jesus says in this scripture is we need to tend it. We need to find the right combination of nutrients. And in fact, that combination is going to be a little stinky. It may not be exactly what you want to find. But that combination can make it bloom again. So I don't know about you, but I come from a line of farmers. So my dad, whenever I go to plant stuff, always tells me, you did buy the manure, right? Because if you want it to grow, you got to throw the manure into my garden. And everybody always laughs at me about this, right? But we planted trees in my yard. Two apple trees, a pear tree, a cherry, a ginkgo, And some of them did really well right away. The cherry tree decided not to listen to its instructions to be one of those cascading cherry trees. It decided it was going to be a real cherry tree and grow up and out. And the ginkgo tree did really well the first year. And the apple and pear tree, nothing. We got leaves. So I was like, okay, I know they're babies. They're just teenagers and they're not ready to reproduce yet. They need some time. So the next year, I'm so excited. I take pictures and it looks like one of the apple trees is going to have two apples. <laughs> I'm really, really excited about this, right? And then... We have a killing frost in May. All the leaves die on all my baby trees. And there are no apples. And the ginkgo loses all of its leaves. And for half the summer, it looks like it's not coming back. So I continue to water it. And unlike all the other people, even those who went to agricultural school, I was like, it needs some manure. So stealthily, I manured all the trees so that they could have some nutrients and grow. And the next spring, the apple tree, one of them, had so many apples on it. I was so excited. I got to pick and share apples with the families that came to my church on Wednesday nights in the summer seeking food. But they're still babies, those trees. And that means they need extra care and attention. And right now, because of the mess of the world, I mean, if you're not worried about climate change, if you're not worried about war, if you're not worried about COVID, it makes it hard to move forward. It makes it hard to step out of what we've been doing and what is comfortable. In fact, we want to burrow in, right? We want to do all those things that bring us comfort. That's why many of us have taken up the baking bread and eating way too many carbs theory of the last two years. 
because we need something that helps us deal with all that is going on out in the world. All that seems so challenging and we struggle with and we don't know what to do about it. And we aren't sure what comes next. And that's what this parable says, right? It doesn't give us an answer. But what it says is that there are going to be times, there are going to be times that we go through where we don't bloom with figs. There are going to be times when it's hard to find those figs. But during those times, if we sit with it, if we, as the many say, get still and be quiet, if we turn back to God, if we sit and provide what is needed, in this case, digging out some more space for the roots, applying the manure that will make it grow, the potential for that tree is amazing. But right now, we're in that spot where we're thinking about applying the manure, but haven't yet. And that's why when we look at that scripture, sometimes you wonder how the things connect, right? Because Jesus tells us two stories about repentance and then tells a parable that doesn't say the word repent in it. So how are they related? This whole section in Luke before chapter 13 invites people to turn around, to turn back to God, to see that life as they have been living it hasn't been what is needed to flourish, hasn't been all that we could have so that we could thrive. And if they turn around, if they turn around and turn back to God, that's what repentance means in Hebrew, to turn back, to turn around, to turn towards God. If we just do that, we will find those things that help us to thrive and not just survive. And what Jesus tells us in that first part of the scripture reading today is there are bad things that happen. In that very first section, he talks about how the powers that be, the government, has taken the blood of Galileans and used it as a sacrifice. And he asks, aren't they as worthy as anyone? And then he shares the story of a tower that has killed people when it fell. And ask, aren't they as worthy? What if in this fallow time, in this time where we are not quite growing, we're staying the same, we're in stasis and not ready to bloom? What if in this time we think about what it means to thrive? We think about what it means to flower and bud and create fruit. Jesus tells in his Sermon on the Plain that you can tell the good fruit from the bad fruit. That you can tell a tree that bears good fruit by the actions they perform. And maybe what Jesus is inviting us to in this scripture is to set those conditions, the manure, that will help us to thrive. What is it that helps us to turn back to God? What are the acts that bear good fruit? And 
that's where we turn to what Jesus did, right? What he tells us about how we are to live our lives. That's how we turn to our neighbors. And we say, you're welcome. We invite them in. We help them find those things that they need to survive and thrive. We learn what it means to love unconditionally and extravagantly. And that's what Jesus teaches us. That when Jesus looked out at the world, he never saw an enemy that couldn't become a friend. He never saw someone as so distant and different from him that they couldn't receive the same grace and mercy and healing that he gave to everyone else. And he invites us to join that journey to help create the conditions so that everyone can thrive. So that everyone can begin to bloom. And that's why this scripture, when he tells the story, says it isn't going to be a quick process. You aren't just going to get your plant and grow its roots and put it in its pot and boom, the beautiful flower appears. Sometimes it takes time. Sometimes it takes more time than we're willing to give. But if we tend that garden, those flowers, even if they turn out not to be white and smelly, start to bloom. And we are invited to bring those blooms along with us. Amen.